an author from years gone by, J.C. Ryle, said this, All men ought to think of Christ because of the office Christ fills between God and man. He is the eternal Son of God through whom alone the Father can be known, approached, and served. He is the appointed mediator between God and man through whom alone we can be reconciled with God, pardoned, justified, and saved. He is the appointed mediator between God and man through whom alone we can be reconciled to God. That's the message of the Scripture tonight as we look at Exodus 19, verses 7 through 25. The verses we looked at Sunday in Exodus 19, 4 through 6, God told Israel He was going to enter into a covenant relationship with them. They would be His treasured possession if they obeyed the terms of the covenant. God is now preparing to give His people the terms of the covenant, which we usually refer to as the law, the commandments, the, the Mosaic covenant. He's, in chapter 20, He's going to begin giving them the terms of the covenant. Now what verses 7 through 25 of chapter 19, we might call that the preparing the people to receive the covenant. That's basically what's happening in these verses. But what stands out in these verses is Moses' role as mediator between God and the people. We see how Moses functioned in this go-between role serving God to the people and responding from the people to God. And what we learn as we see this, we, we understand how Moses prefigures Christ, our greater mediator of the greater covenant. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, the covenant of salvation. And what Moses did is he points forward to an even greater mediator who will fulfill an even greater role than he did in bringing salvation, being a bridge between God and God's people. The main idea of the text tonight is simply this. It is only through Jesus as our mediator that we can have a covenant relationship with God. I want to read the scripture tonight beginning in Exodus 19 verse 7. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. He said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down, warn the people so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. 
Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. What we see in these verses is three ways that Jesus functions as our covenant mediator. As we look at the role Moses played as a mediator between God and his people, we can see three particular ways Jesus functions as our covenant mediator. And here's the first one. As our mediator, Jesus enables us to communicate with God. For the people to have a covenant with God, God must be able to communicate with the people, obviously. Well, that was part of Moses' role as Israel's covenant mediator. God had given Moses a message to give to Israel. It's in verses 4 through 6. We looked at it last week. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings, brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is God's message to his people. Moses brings the message to them. And then in verses 7 and 8, we see God bringing that message to the people and then he takes their reply and goes back to God. You see what Moses is doing. He's being God's mouthpiece to the people, being the people's uh, mouthpiece. I don't think there's this thing as a mouthpiece. He's being the mouthpiece for God and for the people. The people agree to be God's covenant people, his treasured possession, obey his covenant. Now look at verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. So God's going to come down on Mount Sinai, but the people aren't just going to see him, they're going to hear his voice as he speaks with Moses. Now there's a very important reason why God wants him to hear his voice. And he says in verse 9, so that the people may hear when I speak to you and may also believe in you forever. See, God chose to communicate with his people through a covenant mediator. And if that's going to happen, if God is going to rely on this mediator to communicate his word to his people, then the people have to trust the mediator. You with me? If the people don't trust Moses, then the plan doesn't work. So what God's going to do to show them that he indeed is speaking to Moses is going to speak to Moses where they can hear it. You with me? then they would have no reason to doubt when Moses later says, I have a word for you from God, they would know that God truly and does indeed speak to Moses. Being in a covenant relationship with God requires communication. This is part of the role that Moses served as a mediator. Just like God communicated with Moses through a covenant mediator, you know, he communicates with the church through our mediator, Jesus. I want you to think about a couple of scriptures. In John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's talking about Jesus. We get down to verse 14, it says, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among men. And we learn when he says the Word, he means Jesus. Think about what it means to call Jesus the Word. Jesus is how God communicates himself to his people. That's what a word is. A word is how we communicate. By calling Jesus the word, he's saying this is God communicating himself to man. Jesus is the clearest 
communication of God to, to people ever. The clearest revelation of God to people is Christ. Here's another verse to consider. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. God has spoken to us in these last days through his Son. The gospel, the message of the New Testament. I want you to think with me for just a minute. What happens if you take Jesus out of the equation? We know nothing about God's plan of redemption. We know nothing about how to be saved. If all we had was the Old Testament without Christ, we would not understand it or interpret it rightly. How do we know that? Because of the Jews in Jesus' day. They'd had the Old Testament for centuries, but they didn't get it. They, they didn't get God's plan of redemption. They couldn't hear it. They couldn't receive it. Why? Because they wouldn't hear Jesus. Jesus is the key to interpreting the Old Testament correctly. See, if we don't have Christ, we don't, we don't know God's plan. We don't know uh, who God is really and how we can have a relationship with him. It's like me trying to preach in Thailand and Africa. I've preached both places. It is frustrating beyond your imagination. But it's like me trying to do that without an interpreter. I, it doesn't communicate. It doesn't connect. The words don't mean anything without someone between me and the people to make my words plain to them. It's the same way in a covenant relationship with God we need a mediator to communicate the truth of God to us. And God does that through his son. There is no relationship without communication. As our covenant mediator, Jesus enables us to communicate with God, not only by giving us the scripture, but also by giving us the privilege to enter the presence of God in prayer. But that's not all Jesus does as our covenant mediator. As our mediator, Jesus prepares us to meet with God. He makes us fit, you might say, to meet with God. So here's the situation. God is going to come down on Mount Sinai. His people will both hear him and see him. Now Moses is given instructions by God uh, to prepare for the meeting between God and his people. He's told to consecrate the people. Verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them. Today and tomorrow, this people would spend two days consecrating, being consecrated and preparing themselves to meet with God. Now, the scripture doesn't tell us in great detail what all that consecration involved, but it does tell us two things. First of all, the people were told to wash their clothes, their garments. You see that in verse 10 and again in verse 14. Have the people wash their garments. Now, washing the clothes is about acknowledging the need to be clean and pure when you approach God. There's nothing spiritual about having clean clothes. It's about the people in the process of cleaning themselves and their clothes they're contemplating the need to be clean when you approach God. Their need, listen, it's an outward act that reminds them of their need for inner purity. The second thing that people were told to do in verse 15 is to abstain from sexual activity. It says, do not go near a woman. That's what that means. Okay? And now, it's not that there's anything wrong with marital sex. That's not it at all. The purpose is it's a form of fasting. You abstain from certain things in order to focus on certain other things. Fasting is generally abstaining from food to focus on prayer, seeking God. Well, this was uh, something that said, you know, don't do anything that will distract you from focusing on God. So this is a time to 
reflect on their need for inner purity, to consecrate themselves, to think about God and the things of God. Now, what I want you to notice is uh, the text also says Moses wasn't just to consecrate the people. Moses was to consecrate the place where God was going to meet with his people. If you'll look with me in verses 12 and 13, what you see is God tells Moses to set bounds for the people all around the mountain, a boundary. Now, here's the idea. If you look down in verse 23, what you'll notice is Moses refers to this setting, this boundary around the mountain. He refers to it as consecrating the mountain. The the word consecrate is our English word sanctify. That's the, not English, but our New Testament word. The New Testament uses the word sanctification rather than consecration. It's the same thing. It, it means to set something aside uh, as holy, to set something aside specially for God's purposes. That's what was happening to the people. They were being made holy. They were setting themselves aside for God's purposes. That's what Moses is doing to the mountain. Think about the tabernacle and the temple. That's the same idea. They were consecrated. This is the place where God would dwell with his people. They were considered a holy place. Well, that's what's happening on the mountain. The mountain is considered a holy place, the place where God would meet with his people. And uh, if you think about it, that explains God's instructions to Moses in verses 12 and 13. He says, look, If anybody touches the border around the mountain or anybody crosses this border, they shall die. You can't touch them because they're cursed, polluted, but you have to kill them either with stones or it says shot through, which means an arrow. Okay, so you couldn't touch them, but they had to die because they've tread on the holy place. It would be like a common person walking into the holy of holies in the temple okay this is just not done you don't walk casually into the domain of god to the place where god has set aside as his own bottom line here's the idea those who would meet with god must be made holy they must be set apart they must be sanctified and that's what jesus does for you and i now what moses is doing is really just symbolically consecrating the people. Washing their clothes and abstaining from sexual activity doesn't actually make them holy spiritually. But what Jesus does is to actually make the people of God holy in God's sight. What God is trying to teach the people is the necessity of being holy if you're going to be God's people. Through Moses, that's what God's teaching us. And this is what Jesus does for us, what he accomplishes for us. Listen, Christ's work of salvation is a work of sanctification. In saving us, Jesus is setting us apart, especially for God. We're sanctified through faith in Christ by a work of the Holy Spirit. When we come to faith in Christ, the Spirit of God does a supernatural work in us, sanctifying us. Here's a couple of scriptures you might want to jot down. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Paul says, such were some of you, talking about different sins they used to engage in. He said, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Christ, by a work of the Spirit, sets us apart from the world for God's special purpose. You're made clean and pure in God's sight. God looks upon you as holy. And you're in the process of being made holy in thought, word, and deed. Listen, to meet with God, we must be consecrated. 
We have to be work of the mediator. Jesus. I want you to think about this. Suppose a homeless person is invited to go to dinner in London at the palace with the queen. Now there's some things that are going to have to happen before that can take place. Somebody's going to have to take this homeless person who's probably dirty and hasn't had a shower or a bath, probably doesn't have good clothes. Somebody's going to have to clean that person up. Going to have to give them the appropriate clothing to wear. Going to have to go over some etiquette matters, right? The do's and don'ts of being in the presence of the queen and having dinner, right? Somebody's going to have to prepare that person for that occasion. Listen, that's what the mediator is doing. He's stripping off our old filthy sinful clothes, robing us in his righteousness, right? Making us fit to be to meet with God. And there's something else. We would never have access to God. Here's the third thing Jesus does as our covenant mediator. As our mediator, Jesus gives us access to God. Verses 16 through 19 describe the scene as God descends on Mount Sinai. So it came about on the third day when it was morning There was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud on the mountain, a very loud trumpet sound. This doesn't mean somebody blew a trumpet. It means from heaven a trumpet sounds. So all the people who were in the camp trembled. Then Moses brings the people out of the camp to draw near to the foot of the mountain to meet God. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently or trembled. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. There's no way to read this text appropriately and really give the picture of what that must have been like. The scene was designed to give the people a glimpse of the awesome power and greatness of God. That's why it says in verse 16, they trembled. That's understandable. They are to see God's power and greatness. Listen, God did not appear to his people as a divine Santa Claus, just waiting for you to jump up in his lap. He did not intend to appear to his people that way. He wanted them to know the seriousness of coming into the presence of God, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. This is no God to be trifled with. Three times in verses 21 through 24, God warns Moses what happens if the people try to come up the mountain into the presence of God. Verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, go down, warn the people so they do not break through to the Lord and gaze and many of them perish. How are they going to perish? God was going to kill them. Verse 23, excuse me, verse 22, also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves or else the Lord will break out against them. Same idea. Going to kill them. Verse 24, you go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord or he will break forth upon them. Three times God says this. The picture is very clear. God is holy. Keep your distance or you will die. God is holy. Keep your distance or you will die. Listen, here's the question though. How is God going to have a covenant relationship with his people if they can't draw near to him? How is God going to have a covenant relationship with his people if they don't have access to him? Well, the people would have access to God through their mediator, 
Moses. The people remained at the foot of the mountain, but you see at verse 24, it says Aaron and Moses were to go up the mountain. Now here's the way it worked. The people are at the foot of the mountain. Aaron would go part way up the mountain, and Moses would go to the top of the mountain and meet with God on behalf of the people. The tabernacle and the temple are patterned after the mountain. The, 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 the mountain you have, Mount Sinai, you have the foot of the mountain part way up, and then the tip where God would meet with the mediator. Well, the tabernacle and the temple are the same way. Well, you have the outer court where the common people, most people stayed. You have the holy place where the priests were allowed to go. That would be Aaron. And you have the most holy place, the holy of holies, where only the high priest could go once a year on the Day of Atonement. That's Moses. So the people have to keep a distance, but Moses is going into the very presence of, the, of God to meet with God on behalf of of the people. You see, the people did have access to God because Moses was going before God on their behalf. Now, the same thing is true for you and I as New Testament Christians. We have access to God through our mediator, Jesus. By his life, by his death, by his resurrection, Christ united us to himself spiritually by virtue of our union with christ because we are in him we can now draw near to god without fear of judgment because remember god sees us with the righteousness of christ god sees us in union with christ and therefore now because of christ we can now draw near to God. Hebrews 4 16 says it like this draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. Right? Why? If you read the context there, it, it's talking about because Jesus is our high priest, he's our mediator. Because of that, we can go into the presence of God without fear of judgment. Here's another scripture. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. That's Matthew 27, 50 and 51. Jesus is on the cross. He gives a loud voice, dies, and the veil in the temple is torn from top to bottom. From top to bottom shows that God did it because men could have only done it from the bottom. And the tearing of the veil, this is the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, from the most holy place. And God tore it in two to show that God's people now had access to God because of the death of Christ on the cross. Because of the mediator, God's presence is no longer forbidden for the people of God. Because of our mediator, we have access to God in several ways. We have access to God in prayer. We have access to God in worship. We have access to God because his very spirit lives within us. His very presence is in us. Beyond that, we have access to the, to the uh, dwelling place of God in heaven when we pass from this life. Here's the thing I need you to see. Because of Christ... We are not in relationship with a God who is unapproachable. We don't have to keep our distance. We don't have to fear the judgment of God because in the mediator we're safe. On your own, apart from Christ, you can't enter the presence of God. How many of you remember, you know who Uzzah is? Uzzah from the Old Testament. You remember King David was transporting the Ark of the Covenant. He wanted to bring it back to Jerusalem. They were putting it, they had it on a cart. As carts do, it bobbled. The Ark was a little unstable. Uzzah reached out to grab it. Dead Uzzah. Why? Because that symbolized the presence of God with his people. You don't reach out and touch God. 
See, it's no longer the case for you and I. Why? Because we are in Christ because of our mediator. Here's a wonderful scripture. This is Hebrews 12, verse 18 through 24. And what this actually does, it shows the difference in coming to Mount Sinai as the people did in the Old Testament and coming to what the text calls Mount Zion, coming to God in Christ. Listen to this, Hebrews 12, 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound with such that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken. They could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. The author of Hebrews said, that's not you. That's the scene we're looking at. This is what he says. But you have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. You, you get the difference in the picture? One is a picture that is frightful. And another is a picture of joyfully coming into the presence of God and the saints and the angels. That's the difference the mediator makes. Most of you will be like me. You have never heard of a place called Meghalaya. It's in uh, northwest India. It's been argued that it's the wettest place on earth. Uh, it's a mountain that's a mile high, and it has a... Uh, it holds the world record for the annual accumulation of rainfall. Um, in one year, the rainfall topped 82 feet, not inches, 82 feet. Staying dry, of course, is a battle if you live in this place. But you know the biggest challenge the rain causes is not actually trying to stay dry because of the heavy rainfall over the years what used to be creeks have turned into gorges and valleys that now cross the rainforest impassable most of the rain falls during the summer which is called monsoon season and uh in this time of year what general creeks become raging rivers and it's it, they're literally impossible to pass on foot so they need an extravagant commuter bridge system to enable people to um, keep the villages connected to one another. The problem is normal bridge concepts are not an option in this place. Because of rainfall, any wooden bridges would collapse due to erosion in almost no time. If you tried to anchor them to the ground, the ground would erode and it would never work. Concrete and steel are not alternatives in a place like this. So the members of the tribes, the Casas people, they, uh, they crafted a very ingenious solution. On, on a riverbank, a small tree called a strangler tree would, would be planted. Once the tree's large enough, roots have taken, you know, the, the roots have taken into the ground. They would actually dig, dig, dig down and extract the roots, not unplant the tree, but extract the tips of the roots from the ground and allow the roots to continue to grow on top of the ground. When, when, the, when the roots get long enough, they take the roots and stretch them across the gorge and plant them into the other side of the gorge where they grow and take root and get strong and thick. And then the roots from other strangler trees are interwoven with those. And over time, this, this root system grows large and strong and it's rooted to the ground. And they put mud on it and kind of like making a pavement and voila, the bridge is open for business. They are living bridges. 
the largest one is called the Umshiang Double Decker Root Bridge. Get this. It's more than a mile long and 2,400 feet in the air. Living bridges. See, that's exactly what Jesus is. He's a living bridge. And that's exactly what you and I need. We need a living bridge if we're going to have a covenant